Um, thank you all for coming tonight, for joining us once more on Zoom. Um, but I really hope that all of you are here um, because maybe you've come in and already seen the wonderful Justin Favela exhibition. Um, so you'll have a, a little bit of reference for um, the amazing things Justin's going to talk about tonight. Um, Jill said I found Justin, which is a really weird, weird thing to say. Um, Justin was out there doing fabulous things and I got very lucky um, about seven years ago. I was at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and I saw Justin's work um, for the first time, saw one of his um, pinata sculptures. Um, and I started sort of following him on, on social media and watching what he was doing in the art world. And then in 2017, I saw his amazing installation, Friedelandia, at the Denver Art Museum. And at that point, I went to our director, Jeff Fleming, and said, we have to bring Justin to do an exhibition. And we invited him, and he very grace, gratefully uh, agreed. And he came to the museum in 2019. Um, and we planned this exhibition for 2020. Um, and I think you all know what happened there. Um, but luckily, Justin was very amenable, and we were able to push back a year and make Central American happen in 2021. Um, and I really think, um, I'm sorry we had to wait an extra year, but it just feels like such a wonderful, um, just beautiful place to be now as we're all coming back together, as we're all still needing um, some beauty and fun in our lives with everything that's going on. So I just wanna thank Justin, not only for being here this evening, but for bringing this, this beautiful, beautiful exhibition to our museum. Um, a little bit of background, about Justin. Justin is from Las Vegas um, and went to UNLV. He also has a close relationship with the Barrick Museum in Las Vegas, which I highly recommend going to visit if you go to Las Vegas. Um, I got to see one of his great shows there that brought some of those fabulous Las Vegas casino carpets to life in a really interesting way. Um, he's at exhibitions at the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, the Prudential Center in Boston, the Sugar Hill Children's Museum in Brooklyn, um, in the Berman Museum just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, right now, if you go to New York and go to the wonderful El Museo del Barrio, you'll see their La Triennale exhibition, which is a group exhibition of Latinx artists around the United States. And Justin has some wonderful um, uh, paintings in that show and actually got to see his work uh, broadcast over Times Square as a result of that exhibition. So if you wanna dig a little deeper, check that out after we're done here. Um, I'm going to keep it brief because I know Justin has so many amazing things to tell us. So with that, I'm going to welcome Justin Favela. Thank you. What a great intro. Um, yeah, thank you all for having me tonight and, um, and for making my dreams come true. Uh, I walked into the Des Moines Art Center over two years ago after exploring Iowa for a little bit and I was obsessed with taco pizza. And I looked at Laura and Jeff and said, I wanna make a taco pizza chandelier. And uh, they said, sure. <laughs> and so that was like my first idea for the show. And then once Laura and I started talking um, about Iowa and how I like to make my work site specific, I went through the collection uh, at, at the uh, Des Moines Arts Center and, I uh, was really inspired, you know, one of some of my favorite artists are minimalist or like pop artists. And so you have some Oldenburgs in the collection that I really wanted to kind of have a conversation with. And that's kind of how this show kind of grew into a celebration of Iowa, but also kind of this, um, uh, this ex exhibition that that is really kind of biographical in a way too because I was really searching for my own identity through the collection and so I'm going to go over that in a little bit but before I do that I am going to um, show you a little bit of my previous work and we'll get to Central American at the end um, but before we do I'm so excited that everybody's eating nachos it's like actually nachos is my favorite food um, and some of you went all out I was looking at Bill they got a crock pot going and stuff <laughs> it's amazing um, I am also I made my own cheese dip so I'm also eating with you guys um, okay well let me share my screen and we'll do this presentation and uh, if you have any questions, save your questions for the end and we'll do a Q&A. All right. Oh, <clears throat> all right, here we go.
Oops. Uh, here we go. I swear I know how to use a computer. Okay, here it is. All right. Well, um, welcome to Nacho Nash. Nacho Nash. <laughs> oh my gosh. And um, and also my artist lecture. Uh, so um, I was born and raised in Las Vegas, as Laura said, and you know. Las Vegas visually is a really stunning city and also like a very confusing city. And I get a little, a lot of inspiration by um, the neon signs, the architecture and kind of just, you know, the, the myths and the legends of Las Vegas. Being a local, um, growing up here, you know, all of the, the, the Las Vegas Strip uh, is like where a lot of my family worked, but of course not all of us you know, live and work on the strip here in Las Vegas. But um, just to give you a general idea of the things that I would see, uh, you know, as a kid growing up or even as an adult when I started working at these casinos. Uh, so here's Caesar's Palace, um, probably the, like has the biggest, one of the biggest footprints on the strip. And it's just so amazingly uh, disrespectful to art history. And that's exactly why I love Caesar's Palace, right? It's like the Disneyland version of everything you learned in your first art history classes. And then over here, uh, this is <laughs> a picture of the Luxor. Um, the Luxor is uh, modeled after the Sphinx and uh, one of the great pyramids. Uh, and so, you know, cultural appropriation is something that we do right here in Las Vegas or wrong, depending on how you look at it. Um, the Venetian, um, one of my one of my favorites because they really were the first to go all out and implement this uh, five o'clock uh, sky. It's always five o'clock inside. You could see that's actually a painted ceiling. And then I'm gonna go back now to the 80s, the early 90s of Vegas when I grew up here. This is the Las Vegas Strip. Um, very different than what it looks like now, um, but the neon signs uh, were, I think, the first sculptural pieces that I really paid a lot of attention to and was like really in awe of growing up. And so when I first started making artwork, I wanted to talk about my identity as a Las Vegan, and I started to look at these signs as more than just you know, uh, um, a signifier for uh, the casino, right? I wanted to really celebrate the, the materials and the way that these signs were made and the design of them. So I started to look at the Stardust sign and the Stardust sign went through many changes in the 80s. They put this big uh, you know, Futura Bold condensed font on it when Vegas started going corporate. Um, and I noticed that change, um, but this is the one that uh, this is the sign that I would drive by all the time when we were picking up my grandma from work. She used to be a maid at the Dunes, which is now where the Bellagio is, if anybody's been to Las Vegas. So <clears throat> Stardust uh, was a really cool casino and really had a really cool sign. This is a big, actually, atomic cloud. It used to be pink. It used to really look like an atomic cloud. Uh, and um, it kind of went through different iterations over the years. And I wanted to make my own version of it and thought, what would it say if I were to make my own version? And so I made this piece here called Estardas. And that's uh, the way that my grandma would phonetically say Stardust, right, in Spanish, Estardas. Um, so uh, it's all made out of found cardboard, house paint, spray paint, whatever I could find. Um, and it was the first time I really used cardboard in this way. And I really liked the idea of using very accessible materials. Um, and then as I went through art school, <clears throat> I started to learn more and more about art history. And you started learning a lot about these big blue chip artists that are really kind of like investment artists that people look at. Uh, and at the time, I think this was like around 2010, 2011, they were building this huge casino complex in Las Vegas called City Center. And they spent millions and millions of dollars on an art collection um, to really show off how cultured this new, um, you know, big uh, property was on the strip. They wanted to show us what fine art was. And so 
at the same time, um, I was doing a show. I was I was conceptualizing one of my first solo shows at the Clark County Government Center, which is right down the street, a government building. And so I thought, County Center, Government Center, there's something here. And so uh, County Center, City Center, right? And so uh, City Center has this big Henry Moore right outside of the lobby. And uh, I learned about Henry Moore in art history class, right? British sculptor, you can see his, his sculptures outside of most big major art museums. And so I wanted to make my own version, but in the same visual language as a neon sign. Um, and so in this exhibition, uh, I remade a lot of the works that were in city center, but with cardboard or just like found materials. And that's really when my like, uh, my ideas kind of just took off and uh, I thought it was really interesting to kind of have a conversation or kind of just like stick myself into art history by referencing uh, the, you know, the great whites, uh, as I call them. And so um, speaking of, uh, this is a piece by Carl Andre uh, found at the MoMA. It's called uh, a floor piece and uh, minimalist work. You're allowed to walk on top of it. I think they're like lead tiles. Um, and so at the time I wanted to make my response to this piece and this is called Floor Sombrero. Um, and at this time I was starting to think about my identity also as a Latinx artist within the art world and looking at the symbols that represented my culture, right? The sombrero, which you could find at any party city or wherever, uh, was uh, a symbol that uh, I, I found funny and interesting. So this just looks like a regular sombrero, but if you look at it closer, it's actually dipped in gesso. And then I just repainted the exact same thing, thinking about that gesture as a way to kind of reclaim that object as like my cultural object. And so um, here is a big square. Uh, this is a big cube uh, by the artist Donald Judd. And this is, my version of that cube. This is 1,095 tamales. So my mom's Guatemalan. Um, and if you're friends with the Guatemalan, you know that around Christmas time, they're making tamales around the clock. These big tamales wrapped in banana leaf and then they wrap them in, in this, the aluminum foil and then steam them. Um, and so uh, this is what it would look like if you ate tamales, if you ate a tamal for every meal, you know, three times a day for a year, it would be 1,095 tamales, just like this. This is a piece by Richard Serra uh, called Stacks, big metal sheets. And then this is my Stacks, uh, they're giant Doritos that I made out of cardboard uh, and paper. So this is also when I started, this is around the same time, 2011, I started looking at symbols that are considered in this country to be Mexican or of Mexican origin, like the Dorito, but are really just, they're just an imagined product of the United States, right? So I'm really interested in how kind of those identities are portrayed in, uh, in, in popular media, but then also just like as products. So speaking of, um, I was doing all this work and I thought, all right, well, I'm already making, you know, work that I think is fun, funny, and I was avoiding. <laughs> so I said, what would be the tackiest, like, uh, like to the easiest symbol that I could use to represent Latino culture, to represent Latinidad? And the piñata just kept popping up in my head. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I gonna do that? Am I gonna be a contemporary artist making pinata work? And so I was like, I gotta get it out of my system, right? And so when you Googled pinata in 2011, this is the first image that would come up on Google Images. And so I made my version of that pinata. I made a life-size donkey out of chicken wire and fabric and paint, kind of like, uh, my own version of paper mache and put it together. I wanted it to have that weight. So that's why I made it out of fabric. And then I covered it in paper. And I said, wow, this piece is really 
uh, funny and also sad. I'm, I'm like making my sad boy art in college. It's perfect. Um, I, I'm so glad I got that pinata out of my system. Let's move on, right? 10 years later, I'm still making pinatas, but um, this really, this really taught me that people, you know, responded to the work. And what I really liked about it is how accessible it is, because everybody, specifically in the United States, knows what a piñata is, considers their origin to be Mexican or Latin American. So just from that simple understanding, uh, I, I knew I had a lot to play with here, and that's when I started to look at different symbols of Latinidad and pinatifying them, right? Just exaggerating them even more and celebrating them um, as something positive. So of course the low rider, you see the low rider in a lot of movies, um, but even myself growing up, you associate the low rider with like gang culture, um, cholo culture, right? So um, I, started to research low riders and started to look at them in a completely different way after learning about the artists and the families behind them and the different kinds of low riders. This is the Gypsy Rose, probably the most famous low rider in the US. And it uh, was done um, by a family in Los Angeles uh, in the 1970s. This is the 1964 Chevy Impala. There's hundreds hundreds of roses hand painted on the car there's you can see there's crushed velvet on the inside and so I made my own version of it the gypsy rose pinata uh, to celebrate the gypsy rose lowrider and um, it was really fun doing this work because you know I got to learn about the importance of family religion ritual that is associated with the lowrider and also the uh, connections to the ritual behind the piñata, right? The piñata is uh, known as this Mexican, uh, uh, you know, party uh, object that you use it during a party, you stuff it with candy, you break it open, but it has its origins um, uh, with the Catholic church in Spain and Italy, they would use it during Lent. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know the I don't I don't exactly know the day but when the last day of Lent uh, people would bring out pinatas into the streets and they would blindfold you and that represented your faith in Jesus they would spin you around 33 times because that's how old Jesus was uh, when he died or when he was crucified and then uh, and then you would hit the pinata and it had seven spikes on it, right? And those seven spikes represented the seven deadly sins. So it was you overcoming, you know, you celebrating that you overcame uh, or that you respected Lent for those days and you got a treat for it. Um, anyway, uh, the car uh, was also a symbol that had many meanings, uh, you know, it's the symbol of American progress, right? We're so proud of, of, of car culture here in the United States. And then for Latinx folks to take this symbol and make it their own and make it prettier and better and make it a work of art is just such an amazing uh, and, and, and symbolic gesture. All right, so moving on. So when I was in school, uh, you know, I, I, I took my, my art history classes and uh, I realized that I never learned Mexican art history or any kind of, of Latin American art history. I don't even think it was offered when I went to school, um, which is a real shame because there's such amazing art in, uh, in Mexico, Central and South America. Uh, this uh, painting, uh, I, I learned about this artist, Jose Maria Velasco, uh, uh, after a residency that I did in Puebla, Mexico, um, I think like, I don't even know how long ago it was, probably like seven years ago now. And uh, after I came back to the States, I started, to, I went and took a Mexican art history class because it was being offered here in Las Vegas at UNLV. And I learned more and more about this person's work. Uh, he was a 19th century painter who did these beautiful, almost like, uh, you know, very romantic uh, postcards almost of Mexico. And they would show these paintings at world fairs. Uh, they would show them in, in Europe uh, to show like the beauty 
of Mexico, right? Spain had, you know, freshly colonized Mexico and they were trying to get more and more people uh, to, to, to keep colonizing Mexico, right? And so this was kind of uh, uh, the symbol of the nation at the time. These paintings were the way that we were communicating to the rest of the world. And so um, looking at these paintings and actually being in Puebla at these exact locations, uh, uh, I realized that they're very romanticized, fluffy versions of them. So uh, that's when I started to think of tissue paper and pinatas as not only an object, but as a medium. And so I started doing these pinata versions of the paintings. Oh. And I'm still doing them to this day. This is another painting by Jose Maria Velasco. I think it's called um, El Valle de Mexico, Visto de El Cerro de Santa Isabel. Um, so just to give you a little, if anybody's been to Mexico City, you can see a little bit of the buildings like past that initial lake closest to us uh, is the beginning of, of the building of Mexico City. The hill that you see right, right there, um, kind of behind the people, uh, that is Tepeyac. That is where the Virgen de Guadalupe shows up um, in, history, in, 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 uh, in Catholic history. And then you can see the two iconic volcanoes in the background. Eventually this whole lake would be filled in and that's where Mexico City was built. Um, so this is one of the most iconic paintings here of uh, Jose Maria Velasco's kind of showing the development of Mexico City. And this is my kind of pinata version of it. So when I'm doing these pinata paintings, I'm not only thinking about like celebrating the culture, but I'm also thinking about literally breaking down the image um, into these almost pixels, right? As a kind of an investigation of the symbols behind or the meanings behind these paintings. So naturally, uh, because I like to make really big work, um, I started to think of these paintings bigger and bigger. I was making them to scale, uh, which the larger ones are like four, four or five feet. Um, and I wanted to make them even bigger after learning also about the Mexican muralist movement. Um, and so I started making them into murals and you can kind of see the process here, kind of I draw like a color by number and then I start gluing the fringe tissue paper. I know a lot of you help fringe the paper um, onto the walls. This is at the Denver Art Museum for a show called Mi Tierra, Contemporary Artist Explore Place. And so it was 13 Latinx artists were asked to take over different galleries in the museum. Um, and I got a pretty big space. And so I collaged a lot of Jose Maria Velasco paintings together to make these big murals. Um, and at the same time, um, because for some reason, I didn't think it was going to be enough to cover every inch of a wall in tissue paper, uh, because, um, you know, uh, I, I feel like my whole life I've just been trained to work really, really hard and that's what's important. Um, and so uh, I, I said, I really want to fill this space and overwhelm the audience when they walk in. And so I started to think of, okay, What's an, who's an artist that I've been avoiding for the longest time um, because it was too easy to comment on this artist's identity. And of course it's Frida Kahlo. And I thought, okay, this is my moment to really uh, uh, start to research Frida and like what she represents. And to many people, Frida is like the Mexican artist, right? Frida and Diego, they're on the money in Mexico. Um, they, um, there's, there's a lot of documentaries and films about them. Um, and when you look at Frida, um, you, a lot of people think of her as, surreal, as a surrealist paint, painter, but she was actually painting uh, like her life. She was very biographical uh, and expressed, her, uh, expressed herself very personally in her paintings. But if you look at paintings like this one, you also realize that she's doing the exact same thing that Jose Maria Velasco was doing. He was doing a very romanticized, exoticized uh, uh, painting of 
of, of reality, right? Uh, you can see all these exotic plants behind Frida, a monkey on one shoulder and some sort of cat on the other one. Uh, and then of course her tying herself, just like Velasco tied himself to the church uh, by portraying very important imagery or like, like the hill of Tepeyac in that last painting, Frida literally has the thorns, right? Around her, uh, around her neck, right? Almost making herself the martyr in this painting. And so uh, she is she is not only like a, a, a Mexican sim a symbol for for Mexican identity, but she's also a feminist uh, 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 a symbol. She's also a, uh, a representative of of, uh, of a lot of queer artists for a lot of people. Uh, she has she she just represents so much for so many people. And so I didn't know what I really wanted to latch onto until. I saw, this is the painting Las Dos Fridas, one of the most famous portraits she did. Uh, until I saw the movie Frida, uh, I think it came out in 2001. Um, and it was a, it, it, uh, Selma Hayek uh, pictured here, portrayed Frida. And um, it's visually a very stunning movie. Um, but if you watch the movie and you really pay attention, the movie's not really about Frida, it's about uh, Diego, uh, which is really sad because that's what happens a lot of times uh, when people make movies about women in history or important women in pop culture. They end up talking about the husbands more than the more than the actual uh, person that's that's uh, title, you know, the titular uh, uh, subject in the movie. Um, just like the movie Selena. Everybody watch Selena again. It's actually about her dad. It's not about her. But anyway, going back to uh, uh, this movie, I found it really interesting that the movie started and ended at, at the Casa Azul, at Frida's house, but specifically in the garden. And, um, and, and so I said, that's it, I got to remake this garden. So in the middle of the gallery, I pinatified the garden. Um, I actually found artifacts that matched the artifacts that were in the movie or the replicas of them in the movie and made replicas of the ones that the Denver Art Museum actually had. Um, yeah, so this exhibition titled Frida Landia was kind of like my Disneyland version of like Me Mexicanidad and the way that uh, kind of Mexican culture has been portrayed in popular media, in film uh, and in art history. So here, this is at the Berman Museum, which Laura mentioned this exhibition. Uh, you could see the scale of the paintings here a little bit better. Um, this is the Valley of Oaxaca, uh, which is a painting that was at their sister uh, museum, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and here's the original painting. And then the Berman also has this really cool uh, basement that they actually uncovered and kind of put glass over it because the museum sits on a hill and I was able to also do a big mural on the inside you can see here um, at the Berman Museum so the museum is kind of like sitting on top of my mural in this in this photograph oh yeah this one I also did the ceiling which I would probably never do again because my shoulders still hurt from doing that yeah. All right, so this is when I went into like my uh, Disney movie research phase, uh, because when I was looking up Frida and the symbols behind, uh, you know, the artifacts and the plants, I, I, I kept going back to the movie, The Three Caballeros, uh, which was made in the 1940s by Walt Disney, kind of an exploration of Mexico, Central and South America. Um, and here is uh, one of the, the background paintings from the movie, which I found really beautiful. Um, at, and uh, I was asked to do an exhibition at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. And so here is uh, the representation of that image in Piñata. A little behind the scenes here, so you can see my Photoshop, my really amazing Photoshop skills. Uh, so here's the, I think these are like scenes from the Three Caballeros, but then I also collaged in scenes from movies like Peter Pan, The Emperor's New Groove, um, uh, 
what other Coco, any movie that had some sort of Latinx or indigenous representation. Here's the crew working on the murals here at Sugar Hill. You can see the whole museum kind of reading area taken up by these murals. And here's the museum in use with the children. All right, so um, not only do I do these big installations, but I also started to dabble in performance art, mostly because I didn't understand it and I just wanted to be part of it uh, and learn more about it, right? So performance art um, is something that, um, you know, is, is usually um, something that's very dramatic, I feel like, and based in trauma a lot, especially for artists of color. And so when I started to think of different performances, I wanted to do something that was, um, opposite of that, right? I wanted to do something that was celebratory, but also some sort of institutional critique. And so um, if you Google like Mexican fiesta or, or, you know, Mexican party, you get images like this. I think these are from the Party City website. And I actually didn't know for a lot of my life that people actually themed their birthday parties um, Mexican, uh, which is really offensive, but I don't think people think about that because they've been doing it for so many years now. Um, and so I was actually uh, showing at a museum uh, when one of the curators had a birthday that was Mexican themed. And I was also asked at that very same museum if I wanted to do some sort of activation or workshop uh, when I came back uh, in a few months. And I said, yeah, I wanna throw a family fiesta, right? I wanna have a Mexican theme party, but do it my way, right? That was the initial idea behind it. And so uh, about 20 of my family members and I flew down to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. And we had a family fiesta and it was the very first one where, um, and you know, this, this piece initially was about kind of, uh, um, you know, showing the museum like, hey, you guys think you know what a real Latin American party is? Well, I'm gonna show you what it is, right? And as soon as we started doing the performance, which was just existing on the South Lawn of the museum and eating and having fun, um, the piece completely changed and became its own thing and I really embraced it. So this is us decorating the space, you know, claiming it as our space and then uh, inviting the public to be part of our fiesta. And uh, it was really amazing just to see um, all these people come together and use this space in a way that it wasn't really intentionally used for, but that a lot of museums hope that their spaces would be used for, you know, like a lot of, a lot of like the, like the uh, Des Moines Art Center have beautiful, like a beautiful park uh, and, and grounds connected to it. Um, and so, but, you know, because museums are really thought of these, a lot of times sacred, sacred places or untouchable places, a lot of people don't feel comfortable um, really hanging out in those, in those places, even the people that work there, right? And so after we did this performance and we were playing our own music and playing games, um, for example, a lot of the groundskeepers uh, and their families started showing up to uh, the family fiesta and they would tell us like, hey, this is the first time uh, that we've ever felt like we understood what was happening here at the museum. So we brought our families. And so it became, uh, it, it, it still remains an institutional critique, but it's more about institutional inclusion and, uh, and really collaborating with institutions um, to kind of not only rethink what their programming is and who it's for, but just to, uh, just to really see how we could celebrate the people that are in, in these communities, right? So uh, this was the very first family fiesta. The second one um, I did on my own actually, because 
I was learning a lot about land art just a few years ago, maybe like five years ago. And this is a piece made in 1970 by the artist Michael Heiser. Uh, it's called Double Negative. And you can see the two canyons dug out of this mesa uh, near Overton, Nevada. Um, here's a here's a close up of the inside from the inside of one so you could see and then over the years it's fallen apart you know this piece is about entropy and um and i guess uh access to a bulldozer so um this uh piece this is what it looks like now after my aunts decorated uh one of the sides of double negative we had a family fiesta inside of uh of of uh of Michael Heiser's uh, land art piece. You could see us here doing some pinata time. That's my little cousin, my Aunt Mary. She was letting out a lot of aggression that day. Um, and here's my family that went to that fiesta. Since then, we've done one at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno on the rooftop of the museum. We did one at the Denver Art Museum as well. You can see us here decorating uh, on, on the front lawn here. My grandma really liked the cows, so we did it in front of the cow sculptures. And there's, the, there's my family that went to the family fiesta here. So now it's kind of become a family tradition. Uh, we try to do one every year. We couldn't do one last year obviously but um, this will be the first one in a couple years here in Des Moines. Here is us at the Neon Museum also known as the Neon Boneyard which was really special because of all the neon signage. I used to work at the Neon Museum many years ago um, just because I wanted to be around those signs. You can see this picture of my family here. You can see in the background that big letter S on the right is actually the letter S from that Stardust sign I showed you at the beginning of the slide. It's actually sitting there now. All right, so moving on. Now, now we get to the nachos and why everybody's eating nachos. Um, so um, I'm also, so another symbol of Latinidad that I'm obsessed with is Mexican American food or kind of this industrialized version of Mexican cuisine that we all kind of see as as like as as truly Mexican. This is of course um, so the Doritos Locos Taco. If you don't know, if you're not familiar with the exquisite Taco Bell menu, okay, it is a actual Dorito, uh, a Dorito that they made into a shell. Okay. Uh, the same ingredients as a Dorito as the taco shell. Um, and so when I saw that, I said, that's it. It's the end of the taco. Like if this is a taco, anything could be a taco. And so I started this project in 2014 called Taco Takeover, where I started to document myself eating tacos anywhere I went. So if I went to, if, so the rule was if I go to a restaurant and there's tacos in the menu, I have to order those tacos and document myself eating them. At the time, Vine was a was an app that all the kids were using. So I wanted to use whatever the contemporary app was. Um, and so there were these quick seven second, six second videos of me eating a taco. And so I thought this was, you know, speaking of performance art, you know, I was looking at different artists like Andy Warhol or um, uh, <laughs> Matthew Barney. And like, they have these, uh, like kind of grotesque pieces where they're eating food, right? But I thought of this as a way for me to physically reclaim this object as mine, right? Like, oh, this is the this symbol represents my culture, right? So, um, and I thought, okay, well, my goal is to eat a taco in every state in the United States and then eventually in every country of the world, right? So it's a long project, um, but it's also a great way to write off all my travel expenses. Okay, so this, uh, so Taco Bell, um, I, I started doing more research on Taco Bell because I mean, their food is perfect there. It's like scientifically engineered uh, to you know, have the right temperature, the right crunch, the right seasonings. 
And uh, the globalization of Mexican food is actually thanks to uh, Glenn Bell and Taco Bell. Uh, he was one of the first people that started using the pre-made crunchy taco shell that you could buy at any grocery store now. And that changed everything because then you could pre-package these shells, send them to all these different franchise restaurants, and you could just slop in whatever uh, toppings you wanted and it was a taco, right? And so um, there's this huge, um, there's this huge debate specifically, <laughs> or especially I should say, within the Latinx community of like, uh, I get so much crap for liking Taco Bell. Now I don't really like it. This is a secret between us. I don't really like it that much, but because it's so polarizing and people don't like that I like it, it makes me like it even more, right? <laughs> and so I just like debating people over it. And so, um, and we'll have the great Taco John's versus, uh, versus Taco Bell debate later. But um, I, I do love the, you know, what Taco Bell represents, right? This kind of like washed down version of Mexican cuisine that now represents us across the world because, you know, Taco Bell um, and different restaurants like that make it to different countries before authentic Mexican food makes it to other countries, right? And that's kind of what we're comparing everything to. And so um, nachos, uh, the nachos, uh, na Nacho Bel Grande to be more specific, those are my, it's my favorite dish from Taco Bell. And so I always wanted to make a piece about it. And I got this opportunity to show in the UK, specifically in Belfast, Ireland. And I said, all right, these people are not gonna even know what this is. And so I started to make these models of nachos and how I wanted to set them up in a gallery. And I was thinking, all right, this nacho pile is gonna be like 20 feet long. And I want the, the chip to hang in the air like 10 feet high. There's no way the curator is gonna be, is gonna go for this. And of course he loved it <laughs> and he flew me out to Belfast and I made this piece here, uh, floor, uh, uh, floor nachos um, at the Mac at the Center for Music, uh, Music and Arts Center in Belfast. So, uh, as part of this exhibition called Shanky, the aesthetics of awkwardness. And so, um, the then these monumental nachos really inspired me to keep making work like this and um, and just really. Uh, asking for what I want, you know, asking curators uh, and, and proposing to curators what I actually wanted to make, um, which was really empowering. And that's one of the reasons why that taco pizza chandelier exists in your museum today. Um, but also like looking at these, at these, um, at these um, sculptures, I realized that a lot of the sensibility that I learned from making replicas of Jose Maria Velasco paintings, um, I, I, I use in the setup of these paintings. So I also think of these uh, as these sculptures, as these floor sculptures, like much like the taco pizza uh, that's on the ground in the main gallery at the Des Moines Arts Center. I also think of them as landscapes. So when I'm setting them up, I'm thinking of them as peaks and valleys and waterfalls when I'm setting them up. Um, just because, you know, Bob Ross taught me uh, what's, what's, you know, aesthetically pleasing when I was watching PBS growing up. So this goes on to a major show that I did at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, Justin Favela, All You Can Eat. It was an investigation, uh, like a research project really, it was really fun to learn about. I wanted to highlight all of the Tex-Mex food that I looked down on for so many years because I too was obsessed with, you know, authenticity and what was real Mexican food and what wasn't. And the more time I spent in Texas, the more I grew to appreciate Tex-Mex, it's its own food, authentically Tex-Mex, right? Um, and who doesn't love queso dip? Who doesn't like sour cream on everything, right? And so uh, this was a really fun show to do um, and all of it was giant food. So here's a, um, a combination plate, uh, enchiladas, two tacos, rice and beans, a little guacamole dip in the back there. Um, fajitas, they're also invented in Texas, um, in Houston at, um, right down the street from where I was, which is really cool. Uh, the margarita, uh, the, mar the original 
margarita machine was from Mariano's in Dallas, Texas. Shout out to Dallas. Um, Chile con carne, uh, invented in San Antonio by the Chili Queens. And then the puffy taco, uh, which is also known as an Indian taco, like in New Mexico as well, which is like kind of this um, uh, flour, fried flour tortilla shell uh, with uh, different ingredients inside of it. Uh, or depending on where you're from, Indian fry bread, they would use as, as a taco shell, which is very interesting. And a, and a kind of a clash of cultures, which is really cool. Um, and then I also made nachos uh, because nachos were actually the first accounts of nachos. I mean, there's many different uh, historians that, that have different opinions, but a lot of them agree that most of, most of them agree that, that nachos were invented on the Texas-Mexico border. And these are uh, floor nacho supreme. So they're different than the other ones because they have sour cream and jalapenos. Oh, and I also put cilantro on these. Yeah, these are fancy. These are really fancy. Okay, and finally, now we get to Central American um, at the Des Moines Art Center. And so these are a few of the process shots, just so you can get a little insight on how we did it and the team. Uh, oh my gosh, big shout out to, you're gonna see some of them in these pictures here. There's Dan and Jay, um, but I, I, I started to, um, so the first thing is we, cover the walls in paper and then I project almost like a color by number onto the walls and then uh, we paper the walls from the ground up uh, so that you know the that you can actually see the image that we're making here's the color key for the project these are the colors that are like the readily available online where you could buy anywhere um, and so uh, like Jill was saying, uh, when my internet went down, uh, I, I was really inspired by a lot of the work in your collection. Um, your collection is so interesting and it has so many different styles and artists in it. And so when I was walking through, I was really thinking about um, the, the collage aspect of like the Sugar Hill show that I did and also Frida Landia, right? And how really those collages were of of movies and art that I that that inspires me and then I see a little you know that I'm connected to in a way and so I started to look at the collection and those were the things that were going through my head what do I connect with personally and then also uh the show now called Central American like what art pieces uh even if it's a stretch uh connect uh, 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 do I see kind of portray Central America? And then also it's it's a play on words, as Iowa being the heart, the center of America, right? And then what pieces portray Iowa, right? Grant Wood, hello. Um, I was so happy uh, to, to get to see these pieces up close and to learn about Grant Wood. Uh, and the more I learn about him, the more I like the guy. Um, I mean, his pieces are so regional, but also so whimsical in the way that uh, he paints landscapes. Um, and so this painting, the birthplace of Herbert Hoover is one of the main features on the entrance wall. When you walk into the, uh, into the gallery, you can see kind of the process here. The, I, I do it all on a program on, on my computer. Uh, I kind of trace it all out. Then I have the color by number and then um, we started to put it on the wall. You could see here, that was the first wall that we did um, in the gallery. And then we started to look at other works and you can see these are the process shots here. We got the Dorito station going, making big Doritos for our taco pizza. And you can see uh, more Grant Wood paintings in the background. Here's the beginning of the taco pizza. And so a lot of people are asking me, why did I, why did I make a taco pizza? Um, for this exhibition, and I thought, and I, and I, and I just remember, like I said at the beginning, going to Iowa to do that site visit a couple years ago with Laura, and learning about taco pizza, and just being uh, amazed at the concept of this food because I've never heard of it before, and I think a lot of Iowans take take it for granted because they don't they don't know that it's like a Midwestern thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I really wanted to celebrate that. And also like this, again, kind of this like this clash of cultures. I don't want to call it a clash, but like, a, you know, th this um, this really cool juxtaposition because, you know, you hear about fusion food and it's like so hip and cool now to go eat like Korean bulgogi tacos, right? But it's like, I don't know, Iowa's been doing it since the 70s, okay? Get out of here, right? So, I mean, I know you guys uh, have a big Italian population and of course there's a lot of farm workers uh, working, working in Iowa. And so somehow in 1974 at Happy Joe's, uh, the taco pizza was invented and you can see the process here. And, I, and even though you can't really see all of these layers, um, I don't know why I do this, but I do it every time. I cover the pizza like I'm actually making the pizza. So you can see the crust. I covered it with beans first, then I covered it with red sauce. And you can see our um, our ingredients, our jalapenos and tomatoes on the side here. And I'll show you another picture in a little bit of the taco pizza. Uh, this is Grant Wood uh, fall plowing. This was actually an image that I found online. It's it's not in your collection. It's part of the John Deere collection, but it flowed beautifully into uh, the landscapes. And this is also another uh, Grant Wood landscape painting um, that's in a different museum. Um, this is Grant Wood vegetables and basket of fruit. Um, lithographs from the 1930s, uh, and they're actually hand colored, which I found really cool. Like this, you, like the light, subtle color. And then uh, if you go see the exhibition, I brightened everything up, blew it up really big, and made this really big kind of like harvest moment right in the center of the gallery. Which and then it starts to kind of transition into Central America or like the Latin American representation. Uh, I was really happy to see this piece in your collection, Carlos Meridas, uh, Los Caminantes del Maya, which um, I, I, the, the, the piece that I have at Museo del Barrio uh, is actually a replica of a Carlos Merida. So I had already been learning about this artist uh, for a little while. And so I was so delighted to see it in your collection. Um, and so that's part of the exhibition. And so is uh, Winslow Homer's uh, banana tree, Nassau. So um, the banana tree and what bananas represent uh, is, is uh, I feel like I could make 10 art shows about bananas. Uh, and so this, this piece is really beautiful, this watercolor uh, in your collection. And I believe it's on display now because uh, I did the uh, the portrayal on it on the murals um, and so uh, you can see us here uh, working on the piece this is actually uh, uh, the, a little easter egg on the side of the walls is this piece here Carrie Moyer's fan dance at the golden nugget which was a I was also delighted to see because I'm from Las Vegas and any reference to Vegas I'm always drawn to it um, I know you also, also have a James Goble in your collection who's from Vegas which is really cool um, and then uh, probably my favorite, uh, I don't want to say it's my favorite because I do like other moments uh, in the murals, but this, uh, this painting by Walter Kuhn, Green Bananas, uh, you know, putting these bananas on a pedestal, you know, it's a very fun and kind of dramatic painting. Um, and you can see the process a little bit here. This was kind of a, one of the more simpler ones, but so elegant, I love it once we put it up on uh, on the wall here uh, at the museum. And so that's kind of like the back of the of the wall or the first thing you see, depending on which into the exhibition. So here's a big view of the entire layout for the some of the folks that haven't been there yet. So you can see kind of the way that I set up the gallery. Um, I I was raised uh, by my Guatemalan family who were all uh, evangelical Christians. Uh, and, um, and my dad's side of the family is Mexican and they are very Catholic. And so, you know, our services as evangelicals were so long. Every Sunday, we had to be at church for like four or five hours. It was a lot. Um, so when I would go to Catholic church, it was a treat for me. 
an hour, hour and a half, and we're out. You get snacks. You get to do exercise, kneel, stand up, sing. This is fun, right? So, <laughs> and what I love most about the Catholic Church was the decorations, the ornate uh, nature of a lot of these churches. Um, to me, it was theater, right? I lo loved it. And, um, and when I went to Mexico to do this residency years ago, I, I ended up spending a lot of time in these Catholic churches because uh, a lot of the churches in Puebla, central Mexico are Baroque, right? And they are just every inch of the wall is covered in ornate decorations and gilded gold scrolls and little cherubs and saints. And so when I'm laying out an exhibition, I have those design elements in my head. So if you, if you look at this image here, uh, that back wall that you see there, I almost thought of that as kind of an altar to like honor uh, the the history of the portrayal of the banana, really, and like what it what it did to uh, it to Central America. And then, uh, but but then when you look closer, you can see kind of Iowa, like uh, the symbols of Iowa and Grant Wood, kind of uh, uh, framing that and kind of pushing you towards towards the back, towards those banana trees that are there. And of course, front and center, right in the middle, I should say, is the is the taco pizza. Um, and then the taco pizza uh, is missing a slice, which is in the atrium um, hanging. Um, it's called taco pizza chandelier. Technically, it's not a chandelier because it doesn't have any light bulbs on it. Um, but I wanted to call it chandelier because uh, Grant Wood has a corn chandelier um, that he made many, many years ago. So it's kind of a, a connection to Grant Wood's piece that's in the, I think it's in the museum in Cedar Rapids. And so, um, I mean, this piece so dynamic and, uh, and so, um, I don't know. I, I think it's one of the, one of the favorite pieces that I've ever made just because it's so specific to Iowa, um, but also it's like the the symbols, the Doritos, the pizza, like everybody understands what it is. People people that have never been to Iowa or never seen a taco pizza, uh, they are like, oh my gosh, I love that taco salad pizza or that nacho pizza that you did. You know, like they, it, it's, it's really, it, it's really interesting uh, to see people's reactions to this, to this piece. And uh, I'm just so happy that I got to tie it into uh, the exhibition and tying it back to kind of that religious aspect. I was very, um, while I was making it, the angle of the pizza, the way everything's kind of floating and falling off of it. I was thinking of that very famous art history piece, the ecstasy of St. Teresa, where she's kind of floating um, in the church. So uh, even this pizza is inspired uh, by the church. <laughs> Justin, there's, uh, Justin, there's a question about um kind of where we are and I think it fits in I know you're we're getting close but yeah how long did yeah. it take for you to complete this exhibition and, and about how many people uh were with you oh my goodness we well I was there for I think like a month and a week month and a half in Iowa and um it took I feel like at some points there was like 20 people working on the exhibition at once it was a lot of folks and so yeah we had about kind of 10 people full time and then volunteers would come in to help. Uh, all, all, I mean, every five days a week, I would go in on the weekends. Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a bunch of people. Yeah, so let's open it up to questions. Okay. All right, let me, let me remove your spotlight here for a second. Okay. I'll bring everybody back. So Justin, if you wanna stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Justin, wonderful. Before we get Thank started you. with the questions, you. your, your career arc is just really fun to follow and it's really smart and it's really um, like joyful. And I Thank you for sharing all of like how you came to where you are today. It's really a pleasure to follow. So um, let's open it up for questions. I know we had the one to get started and I have a couple. Um, 
if you want to, if everybody's like just getting warmed up, Justin, will you explain your shirt, your artist uniform? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's something that also just kind of intuitively happened. I started to wear the same thing every day. Um, I was looking at artists like Frida, like uh, Andy Warhol, people like David Lynch, you know, like they wear the same thing every day and uh, are kind of like cartoon characters in a sense. And um, I also hate picking out clothes in the morning. Like it's just, it stresses me out. And so, um, oh, when I was at Crystal Bridges uh, doing the family fiesta, it was around October and, you know, Northwest Arkansas is the home of Walmart. And uh, I, my family, my family is obsessed with Walmart. I don't know what's wrong with them, but it was, it was a great trip for them because we got to go to the flagship Walmart uh, and there was these skeleton shirts for sale. And so they were like five bucks each. And so what a deal, go to Walmart, ding. So um, I, I bought one just for the trip and I thought it was funny uh, to wear it around, uh, even though it wasn't Halloween yet. Um, and then I real I, I noticed that I started wearing the shirt all the time during my art openings because it I had those memories associated with my family in that trip. And then at the same time, I realized that this shirt was also like a symbol of uh, Day of the Dead, because if I would wear it after Halloween, people would be like, oh, you must be celebrating Day of the Dead. And I'm like, no, but cool. Yeah, thank you. And then so then I started to more intentionally think of it in that way of like this symbol of of like uh, the Chicano movement, the, the Calaca or like the skeleton uh, is, is found a lot in, in the Chicano, in Chicano imagery and even in, in Mexican uh, in, uh, paintings and murals uh, of, of like the 20th century and, and beyond and before. And so um, so then I proudly just started wearing it all the time. And then I started doing these installations where I'm in a place for months at a time. And I thought, well, I'm, and I, I made a commitment to wearing this whenever I'm an artist, like, cause I see it as kind of a, a performance. Right. And so now I wear it every day because I'm booked and blessed, honey. And look, can I, can I share? So at the family fiesta this yes. weekend. This is what's going to be available on t-shirts. You can pull your own screen print if you are a little kid. Otherwise we'll have them pre-printed uh, for adults, but there will be this design by one of Justin's um, dear colleagues. You wanna mention that? Yeah, my dear friend, Dan Hernandez, Dan, known as Dan45. He is an amazing, actually I have one of his pieces right behind me. See that pizza up there? Um, he's, uh, he loves making pizza drawings and sculptures he he made that uh um he helped make the the pizza slice that's in the atrium he designed this uh pizza skeleton shirt specifically for the des moines art center for the family fiesta so that's that'll be limited edition uh justin favela shirt that's so exciting <laughs> okay and any questions raise your hand raise your virtual hand I'm a looking. You don't just want to hear me ask a bunch of questions. Um, Justin, I have a question. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, so every time I look at your work with people and talk about it, a lot of people are really interested in what happens to it when you're done. And that's like one of the first questions that people ask. And can you talk a little bit about how you conceptualize that or what you think about the temporary nature of it or um, like, it, you know, how complex that might be? Like, are you happy that it's temporary? Do you wish it wasn't temporary? Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, my, my thoughts on this change all the time actually, because uh, there was a moment in my career where I was just like, I don't care what happens, burn it all. I don't care. <laughs> like it's about the experience. It's about going to the museum and seeing it in person. Cause it's like this very like intuitive process. And then, you know, it, it's, it's about, um, uh, it's, it's, you know, I thought, I, I just really want to get people to, to go see that, see the pieces in person, but you know, 
uh, there's been a, a few institutions that have figured out how to save the work. And uh, I've had conversations with, uh, um, with different um, registrars and, and archivists and they're like, yes, this is very difficult to kind of keep in good shape for a long time because it is a tissue paper that does fade, but if we keep it somewhere dark and the humidity is okay, it could last for a very long time. And so, um, I don't know. I feel like uh, if 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 there are the resources to save the work and the space, because they're so large, I think that um, that I'm not opposed to it. For example, that taco pizza slice, that's not, that's mine for the rest of my life. I love it so much. But, um, um, but I think the reason why I'm not really obsessed over the permanence of my artwork is because I feel like it really limits what I can do. Uh, not thinking about what is going to happen to it afterward has really uh, liberated me and, 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 made, and, and let me work larger and larger uh, in scale. Because if I had to think about how to save those murals after they were put up, it, it would, they would look completely different and uh, be made out of completely different materials and probably cost like, uh, you know, a hundred times more than they do, right? So it's like, um, I feel like it's the best, uh, kind of the best method. And I really like one time this, this museum professional that I was talking with, um, uh, somebody asked me this very same question, like in like this group, I think it was like a Sotheby's group or something. And uh, the instructor stopped them and they're like, well, it's actually not Justin's responsibility to think about how to preserve his work. That's our job to do that. And I really like that. So now that's what I tell people. I'm like, I don't know. You figure it out. If you want to buy it and keep it in your house, like you can figure it out. And and honestly, um, you know, people are really obsessed also with like buying art that's going to last longer than than they do. Um, but this kind of forces people to people that buy my work or that commission my work to like really enjoy it while it's there. Um, Justin, I just want to add a note from the chat here and then move on yeah. to another question that's in the chat. Um, the one thought is, is have you ever considered it in fabric as a way of keeping it longer? Yeah, yeah, I've done it. I've done it in fabric before. You have. Uh, and is, it's just a there, lot more. Go ahead. It's just a lot more labor uh, to do it in fabric. Um, and it's also a lot more toxic because in order for, well, it just depends. The, the pieces that I've made in fabric have been for public art use because they need to be coated so that they're flame retardant. And so uh, working with that material is not fun because it, it's, it's, it's chemicals you're like working with. But uh, I, I do work with fabric. So, and, and uh, I, I just haven't figured out the best way to use it. I, yeah, I don't like to use I I don't like to use chemicals a lot of a lot of chemicals when I make my work, and so that's just something I still need to figure out. And that there was another like question in the in the chat about like using resin again just as a preservation technique, but I think you've answered that. Well, it's it's actually just it's actually just the cardboard. It's actually just the paper because I I use Elmer's glue, which is actually archival. Uh, it's it's an archival PVA. So the glue that I use is actually fine. It's the paper that has acid in it. Um, Justin, is there a cat like uh, been a? I don't know. It's not maybe too early for a catalog resonate. But is there like a comprehensive catalog available of your work where folks could have a lot of pictures? <laughs> Yo, I'm so glad you asked. Um, I there is actually a. Um, there's actually an organization in Austin, Texas right now called Rizzo Rizzo. They're like a Rizzo graph print shop and they're coming, we're going to come out with a monograph of my work next year in the spring. So we're working on the essays right now. They came to my house and took all the images off my computer. Um, and so uh, there's a book in, in the works and also the Des Moines Art Center, I heard just got their catalogs in for this exhibition specifically. If uh, right, Laura, they'll be they are at the printer 
Okay. And they will be deli- they're supposed to be delivered to us on August 27th, which is Ooh. next Friday. I'm hope if it, you know, they could be a couple days late, but I'm guessing by September 1st, you can go into the shop. They'll be $10. They're amazing. I'm so happy with it. It has, we stuffed more photographs than you can possibly imagine in those pages because it's so amazing. So please um, come to the museum shop, take a look at the show again and buy a catalog. And I have to give, that wasn't my question. That came from one of our guests, Paula, <laughs> who's a great a supporter of the Art Center. And in- oh, thank you, Paula. I appreciate yeah. the question. <laughs> Um, also, there's another question in the chat. Um, so, someone would like for you to talk more about pinata as the medium. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think that I'm really, I'm really interested in, um, I'm really interested in kind of pushing the boundaries of like what's acceptable in like a big institution like a a museum or an art center, right? And so like the question that Mia gave me about like, oh, you know, well, how long is this? Do you ever think about what happens to the work afterwards and how long it's gonna last? And so there's always questions about how archival my work is um, because of the materials. And and also um, a a lot of people don't consider my work fine art uh, or they consider it more craft, like contemporary craft. And there's these like weird distinctions in the art world between like contemporary art, craft, contemporary craft, what I don't, whatever. I, I don't I don't like to like label myself and put myself into those boxes. I like to be in all of the boxes, right? And so, um, uh, yeah. I, and I think that's why I really like to use the pinata as a medium. And like I said, initially, I really thought of the piñata as just an object. And the more I more I worked with the cardboard and the tissue paper and the glue, I started to figure out different ways of using it. So um, not only do I do the piñata fied, you know, murals, but then making the objects and then using the tissue paper also in a flat way to almost like paint it. Like if you go to the, if you go to the exhibit and you look at the crust of the pizza, I love, I love using the tissue paper or like uh, the Dorito that Jill has there in the background. Like I, I, we use the paint, we use the paper almost as paint, right? We like almost like wheat paste it onto a white surface and it just is painted with that color. Um, so it was just, it, it's uh, it, using the, using the piñata has uh, uh, as a symbol it is just, um, using the, sorry, let me say that again, using the, the materials that are used in piñata is just like kind of like a fun challenge for me. Um, and so that's, I think that's why I keep using it and, and learning more and more about it. Um, in the recent years, I've learned also that a lot of the influence uh, in, in paper crafts in Mexico actually come from China. Um, the Chinese uh, b- before the Catholic church would actually make these paper like mache effigies and put fireworks in them and blow them up. So uh, the, the origin of the piñata uh, comes from like different place, different influences in Mexico. And um, I don't know why I didn't even think, think about that because the way you say tissue paper in Spanish is papel china, Chinese paper, right? So, <laughs> um, and you know, the tradition of papel picado and cartoneria in general, um, is uh which is the the craft of uh or like the artisanal craft of like making paper products is like a serious industry in a lot of places in mexico so i'm 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 kind of aligning myself with with those histories um and trying to kind of push the boundaries of uh of what the materials can do that was great thank you there there are Two, two more questions in the chat. Um, okay. One is, um, I think we might, you might have referenced it earlier in the lecture, but have you ever worked in the floor to ceiling um, method before? And if not, why haven't you, or if you have, um, what did you learn about doing it at the Des Moines Art Center? Oh my gosh. So, so um, as you saw in the Sugar Hill images, I used to, um, I used to, to, 
just get on a lift and scaffolding to do the top layers. But because of the pandemic, um, I had to figure out how to make these murals in pieces so that they could be shipped. The, the piece that's at Museo del Barrio right now, uh, it's a big mural, it's like 30 feet long or something. And I made it, I made it here in my studio in Las Vegas. Um, and so doing that, I realized that uh, we could make panels on the ground and then just put them up as we went along. So the show at, uh, at the Des Moines Art Center, um, the, the bottom half of it, we made it in place. And then the other half of it, uh, I, had to, um, uh, I had to trace everything in sections and then kind of spread out the panels and make them in that way. I don't know if that makes sense, uh, but then uh, put, you know, put them up almost like a puzzle, uh, like putting them up in a very specific way so that they looked seamless once you put them up. I had to, you had to cut them in certain angles so you can't see the lines within the within the design. Yeah, yeah. So now I mean, they were cut at that funny angle. I have to admit, I was like, why is it not just a straight piece of paper? <laughs> yeah, because then you would see the straight line. Yeah, yeah. In the design, yeah. Um. So uh, Megan Cohen is on, and she's our, one of our registrars, hey. and she works a lot on the exhibition. And she has a really good question about um in once for the other guests to hear you talk a little bit more about how you're, you interact with new volunteers at each institution and how that influences your installation process. Yeah, I, you know, I always find it so rude and also just weird that a lot of, I've seen this in real life, a lot of some artists not acknowledge the docents or the security guards that are standing in the gallery. Hello, these people. Uh, some of you that are in this uh, Zoom, you're around the art more than anybody else. You are such a valuable resource. So uh, whenever there's volunteers that are from the community or from the museum, um, I, I honestly just like to ask them like, hey, what do you think about this? Um, I remember uh, when, when I first got into um, the the uh, the exhibition space uh, in the gallery. Uh, we had a, we had some volunteers from a local from a local school helping, and I was trying to really problem solve the layout. And I was asking them, like, what do you guys think if I put the banana trees here and then put the corn here? And they're like, I don't know. Like they're not used to being asked. What and and some of them gave me some really great suggestions. And, and I listened to them and, and because of them, it made the exhibition even better, right? So um, yeah, I love including uh, the volunteers. And honestly, usually I'm really inspired by, by, uh, by the volunteers because I'll just, I like to listen to, to what they have to say about the work that I'm referencing. And usually that will actually those conversations and those uh, and, and those stories make it into eventually make it into the exhibition and it makes it more special for me but not, and also for for them to be a part of it which I think is really cool I mean I used to work at a museum and so I know how it feels to be in this space and feel like you have no say in what what happens in the institution and so like um, whenever there was somebody that visited the museum that actually listened to me, um, I, I know that that's important and, and that's special. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also, honestly, uh, like whenever they're helping me, uh, I usually watch them work uh, and I, and I, you know, I learn from them and, and, you know, learn little tips and tricks from the volunteers because everybody works differently. And I'm not like a, a painter by nature. So like seeing the way that people brush things on and construct these objects, I actually learn a lot from. So in a way I'm just using y'all. So thank you so much <laughs> to learn new techniques as an artist. And there, there are lots of volunteers who are on this, um, this Zoom. So thank you for, for being a part of this exhibition. Um, yes, a, thank you. I know we're like we're all right at seven, but there's a, um, another couple. There's another question okay. in here. Can you comment about where you see the line between imitation and being complementary versus cultural appropriation? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, cultural appropriation is all about like what 
in a culture has the most power. I mean, in the United States, of course, we talk about white supremacy all the time. And that's like the world, right? So when you're thinking about cultural appropriation, you could just think like, am I really celebrating this culture or am I taking advantage of uh, how these people do something and not crediting them? You know, so there is a fine line sometimes, but if you're already thinking about it and you're giving the people that you're, uh, that you're celebrating the credit um, and um, you, um, you know, and, and you're really doing, doing the work, the research, uh, then it's definitely a celebration, right? When you're just, when you're just using the symbols and uh, I always bring up Day of the Dead as an example, a lot of institutions just throw together Day of the Dead events and don't know anything about the holiday. Um, and uh, it's offensive, uh, you know, but there's many ways, uh, you know, to, um, there's many ways to make it to make it right. And, you know, I think including the community is the best way you can do that. Because, like I said, learning from your learning from the docents, learning from the guards, learning from your local community, I think is the best way to um, to make sure you're not culturally appropriating if you have that question in mind, you know. And uh, Justin, I think you know, but the Des Moines Art Center has a long history of having a Day of the Dead event. I think we'll be in our 21st or 22nd um, year. And we definitely have a community advisory group that really mm -hmm. steers that project of which I know several are, uh, or there are a few members of that committee who are here tonight. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else who would like to raise their hand or put a question in the chat? Mariella, yes. Amuse. Oh, hi. Um, I'm really curious about something. Um, the way you reflect, um, like one side reflects the other. I'm really curious about that. Is that sort of like you were thinking, like being in a church almost? Or is it just um, the way even uh, with the banana tree and everything, it's, it's, it's really interesting and it gives you... Um, a feeling of awe almost when you enter when you enter the room because it seems bigger than it actually is. So what's what's your thought about it? Having yeah. one reflect the other. Yeah, it's definitely the symmetry is definitely uh, um, referencing the like the layout of a church and the and also it's just like um, it, it's an it, it it was just kind of a way also to to think of the space in a as to, to kind of force a perspective on the space because it's, it actually is not a symmetrical room, but yes. by making the imagery symmetrical mm -hmm. kind of tricks the eye into thinking that it is a symmetrical space. Even if you spend just a little time really looking, it's not right. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but our eyes uh, naturally are attracted to symmetrical figures as humans, right? And mm -hmm. so we, we just, our brain just makes it symmetrical, right? So um, I, I, yeah, I definitely think about that when I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm designing a space. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mariella. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everybody, are we, are we there? Or is there anything more for the moment? Okay. Thank you all there. so much. Thank yep. you, Justin. Feel free to Thank unmute you. and express your thanks or write hearts and applause. Thank Everyone, you. I just want to end by saying, all right, I'll put this up here. We have our family fiesta on Saturday from 11 to 3. And let me tell you what's in the lineup. So Justin and eight of his family members are going to be here. There's going to be plant making and flower making that can be added to the exhibition. Um, there will be some really cool cars by, um, like, I know there's going to be a monster truck, but there might be some, like, Gypsy Rose-esque kinds of cars. I'm excited to see what we have the, uh, on the front lawn for you to Google, Google at. There will be four games of Lotteria with lots of really wonderful prizes for kids and adults. Um, there'll be two pinata times. And there will be, of course, the screen printed t-shirts. We're going to have El Michoacano ice cream bars, 
El Salvador de Mundo Ooh. is going to have pupusa and corn, and Veggie Ooh. Thumper is going to have barbecued chicken and white bean nachos and Frisco Ooh. melts. Um, and if there's going to be music, a, a DJ, and of course, come in and see the exhibition in person. So we hope to see you on Saturday. Tell everybody, 11 to 3, if our parking lot looks full, there's a bus that will shuttle you from Merrill Middle School. Um, Justin. Hope your travel is smooth tomorrow. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm gonna eat so much. <laughs> I know, I think I think maybe tasty tacos is what we need to have for dinner tomorrow night. <laughs> Paula brought that up and I'm a, I'm a sucker for tasty tacos. <laughs> yes, oh my gosh. All right, good night everybody. Thank Bye, you. Bye everyone. everyone.